Sorry, it's, it's live. Okay. okay, everyone, good afternoon and uh, welcome, welcome to our session. Maybe you want to make it a little lower. I'm a loud New Yorker. I'm loud enough. <laughs> so in this session, uh, I think following a very lively... Hello. Okay, that's good. Following a very lively morning session, a very informative one, uh, I hope lunch was not too heavy so people are awake and vigorous and somewhat and receptive. Uh, and uh, what we hope to do is present a number of cases uh, looking at how we respond to these cultural crises in the world. So we're really looking at a number of crises uh, that have um, uh, had responses supported by Olive. People will make presentations, and then hopefully at the end we can have a lively discussion. Uh, so my name is Richard Curran. I'm on the uh, foundation board, the Olive Foundation board. Uh, my day job is with the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., and it's very good to be back here in Abu Dhabi. Our first uh, presenter, the Director General of Antiquities of Lebanon, that is a very tough job, Sarkis Khoury. Sarkis? Bonjour. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers collègues et chers amis, au nom du ministère de la Culture et de l'ensemble de mes collègues à la Direction générale des Antiquités libanaises, je tiens sincèrement à vous remercier pour l'organisation de ce forum prestigieux qui me donne l'opportunité de partager avec vous l'expérience libanaise d'intervention durant les crises, surtout après l'explosion du port de Beyrouth, le 4 août 2020, et de vous présenter le grand projet patrimonial que la Direction générale des Antiquités a initié en association avec un nombre de partenaires institutionnels et associatifs. translation? No. Sorry. Uh -huh. One minute. There's, is somebody translating? In English, <laughs> sorry. They can't hear. These guys can't hear. I'm sorry, Sarkis, you want to start again? Let's see if they can yes. just test. Just test. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers collègues, chers amis. No, they're not hearing. They're not getting. What should I do? Sarkis? Yes. <laughs> you are on again. <laughs> very okay. So very sorry and very sorry to all of you for the delay, but uh, you'll appreciate uh, the translation. Thank you. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers collègues, chers amis, au nom du ministère de la Culture et de l'ensemble de mes collègues de la Direction générale des Antiquités, je tiens sincèrement à vous remercier pour l'organisation de ce forum prestigieux qui me donne l'opportunité de partager avec vous l'expérience libanaise d'intervention durant les crises, surtout après l'explosion du port de Beyrouth le 4 août 2020, et de vous présenter le grand projet patrimonial de la Direction générale des Antiquités à initier en association avec un nombre de partenaires institutionnels et associatifs du domaine du patrimoine et des musées. Dans les heures qui ont suivi la tragique explosion de 4 août, les équipes de la Direction des Antiquités se sont mobilisées sur le terrain à la fois pour intervenir sur les situations d'urgence, mais aussi pour réaliser un état de lieu complet des dégâts sur l'ensemble du patrimoine architectural et des musées de Beyrouth. C'est ainsi qu'est né, en quatre jours, le projet Beyrouth Access Cultural Heritage, dont l'acronyme BAC porte le nom de l'illustre compositeur qui mena la musique classique européenne à l'un de ses plus hauts sommets. Avec le projet BAC, c'est d'ailleurs l'harmonie et la collaboration envers un patrimoine culturel meurtri. Le projet BAC intitulé « Action Plan for the Recovery of Beirut Built Heritage » porte sur la destruction qui ont touché l'ensemble des quartiers historiques de Beyrouth. Plus de 640 bâtiments patrimoniaux 
ont subi des dégâts, ainsi que des musées, des bibliothèques et des industries culturelles. C'est un, en un mot un patrimoine vivant. C'est évidemment un projet d'ampleur considérable qui a nécessité l'aide de nombreux partenaires, notamment Alif, le premier intervenant, qui a proposé une enveloppe globale de 5 millions de dollars pour le, la sauvegarde du patrimoine bâti et des musées de Beyrouth. Un budget à premier égard limité, considérant que la somme des dégâts dépassait 300 millions de dollars. Néanmoins, cette initiative, en plus du soutien moral d'Alif, envers la Direction générale des Antiquités, a créé un effet de boule de neige et régénéré des autres initiatives. Cela a permis à la DGA de créer une plateforme avec tous nos partenaires internationaux, publics et privés, notamment l'UNESCO, avec les Beyrouth Initiative, l'ICOMOS, l'ICROM, l'IFPO, le Musée de Louvre, l'Institut national du patrimoine français, le gouvernement italien à travers leur ambassade au Liban, l'ambassade allemande avec la, le DAI, Blue Shield, World Monument Fund, Honor Frost Foundation, Chrétien d'Orient et bien sûr le BBHR 2020, composé d'architectes volontaires du Centre de restauration et de conservation de l'Université libanaise, qui ont fourni un travail remarquable pour réaliser les premiers diagnostics des dégâts sur le terrain. J'espère que je n'ai pas oublié d'autres partenaires. Au-delà de ces partenaires institutionnels, je tiens à saluer les initiatives bénévoles provenant de la société civile qui apportent une contribution essentielle à la reconstruction. Le premier projet porte sur la réhabilitation du musée national de Beyrouth, car parmi les musées qui ont subi les effets du souffle de l'explosion du port, le musée national de Beyrouth, notre beau musée, symbole de notre unité nationale, de notre histoire commune et de notre mémoire partagée, a en effet un, eu beaucoup de dégâts matériels. Ses portes, fenêtres, ascenseurs, les systèmes de sécurité ont été soufflés et ont nécessité une intervention d'urgence. Toutefois, au milieu de ce chaos, la collection archéologique a été intégralement préservée. Les éclats de verre n'ayant provoqué que quelques altérations légères sur les objets situés à proximité des fenêtres. Le projet de restauration du musée national, dont les travaux ont commencé dès le lundi 31 août, nous le conduisons grâce à un soutien financier d'Alif et l'expertise du musée de Louvre. J'en profite pour remercier chaleureusement la Fondation Alif pour l'aide d'urgence qu'elle nous a immédiatement accordée et qui s'élève à plus de 200 000 dollars. À titre personnel, qu'il me soit également permis, euh, permis de remercier Valérie Frelan, directeur exécutif d'Alif, et Jean-Luc Martinez, l'ex-président directeur du musée de Louvre, qui m'ont témoigné leur soutien dès le lendemain de l'explosion. Cette aide nous permettra non seulement de sécuriser le musée, mais aussi de réparer les dégâts ayant affecté les locaux de la Direction générale des Antiquités. Même aussi beaucoup des projets que Alif a menés à propos des sept projets au Liban. Je ne veux pas les citer tous. Actuellement, le projet BAC a réussi de terminer la première phase d'urgence, qui consiste à consolider les édifices les plus endommagés et les bâtiments ayant perdu leur toiture avec la saison des pluies. Une course contre la montre a été engagée pour que les bâtiments qui ont pu résister à l'explosion ne soient pas définitivement détruits sous l'effet des intempéries. Sur le terrain, j'ai déjà pu constater les efforts bénévoles d'entrepreneurs, d'architectes, des techniciens, tous mobilisés pour protéger en urgence les demeures les plus endommagées. Le ministère de la Culture, la Direction générale des Antiquités, a surveillé à accomplir approximativement 60% de la deuxième phase, qui consiste à consolider l'enveloppe des demeures afin de restaurer leur intégrité structurelle et architecturale, de restaurer les décors architecturaux des maisons dont certains sont d'une valeur d'artistique exceptionnelle. Ce travail se fait en collaboration étroite avec des experts de haut niveau. Actuellement, on estime un manque de budget de 100 millions de dollars pour la continuation des travaux de restauration. Chers partenaires et collègues, c'est un défi considérable 
qui se présente devant nous pour défendre notre patrimoine commun, préalable et incontournable à la reconstruction de l'avenir de l'humanité. Mais ce défi, c'est notre quotidien à la Direction générale des Antiquités depuis des décennies. L'expérience libanaise montre l'importance de la collaboration avec la communauté internationale. Enfin, le ministère de la Culture, Direction générale des Antiquités, se tiendra toujours, se tiendra toujours aux côtés de celles et ceux qui voudront œuvrer à la protection de notre patrimoine commun. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Sarkis. And uh, I think in, in keeping with the spirit and the question of this workshop is, Sarkis, think about, okay, how can we do better? We don't want there to be a next time, but how can we do better? Because that's the overall uh, import of holding this forum and holding this session, which is, I think, many people have been inventing this cultural heritage practice of responding to crisis in very short terms. And as we, as we invent this field of cultural heritage response and protection, how do we do it better in the future so we learn? The Olive Board will meet on Wednesday, and this is one of the questions we're going to consider. That is not only in terms of the making of grants, the evaluation of projects, but how do we improve our own process in the future? So that's something to keep in mind. Our next presenter from uh, Ukraine, the director of the Maidan Museum and the co-founder of the Heritage Emergency Response Initiative, Ihor Poshevalo. Ihor, welcome. Thank you. Okay. Ihor doesn't really need a microphone. If you know Ihor, uh, you know no, he doesn't no, need, need a microphone, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. It's a big privilege uh, to be here with you, to join Alif family, and thank you for having uh, Ukrainian delegation here. Um, as, as Richard mentioned, uh, really it's a time, uh, at least for Ukraine, to understand how we can act better in crisis. No answer at the moment, because we are in a process. Maybe after, in a post-war period, we will speak about it in a much more confident way, but now it's also our different ways to respond to the crisis which happened to be so vast, unexpected, and so large scale. Uh, you all know that <coughs> Russian, uh, Russians attack not only our civil infrastructure, not our military uh, armed forces, but also cultural heritage. And you can see some examples, many, many of them. And it's, it's quite clear that a lot of even politicians name uh, this conflict, and this is really war, as a heritage war or identity war. Uh, you can see quite humble statistics of the destruction. Why humble? Because Ukraine has no access at the moment to many occupied regions in Ukraine. And therefore, the Ministry of Culture has quite a comprehensive list of objects being damaged or destructed, including hundreds of cultural centers, religious sites, libraries and dozens of museums, monuments, theaters, and philharmonies. And often speaking about the damage to cultural sector, we also speak about people, because about 8% of cultural institutions are on temporary occupied territories, and most of these people fled outside this territory, outside of their homes, their uh, home institutions, and many of them outside of Ukraine. Uh, but not only damage and destruction of movable, immovable, uh, tangible, intangible cultural heritage are uh, touched by Russians, but looting and illicit trafficking, also a big issue. Today in Ukraine, and we talk a lot about this, and you can see some examples which became world known. And uh, Kherson Art Museum, about 90% of artworks looted and relocated to temporary occupied Crimea, and the museum professionals, museum people from the Kherson uh, Art Museum identified their art collection, which is today in the Central Museum of Tavrida in Simferopol. You can see some of them in stock in corridors. It was in social media, and we don't know what was the reason to make this collection 
illicitly trafficked public. Maybe the most important of it is somewhere, hidden, not public, maybe someone's collections, uh, so-called black collector's collections. Um, and of course, a lot of art objects, uh, including ar archaeological, historical values. Maybe you've heard about the Skith and Gold collection from Melitopol, a local law museum also looted. And it was hunted for this, and our American colleagues, including the Smithsonian Institution, Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, and that famous for Ukraine, uh, the Satellite Heritage Laboratory in Virginia at the Natural History Museum, they helped us to trace uh, those crimes against culture because satellites help to uh, collect evidences, to collect facts about looting, about illicit trafficking. And together with ICOM, uh, the Ukrainian committee worked out a red list for ICOM, uh, which we hope will be quite instrumental for customs, for auction houses, because the scale of illicit trafficking of Ukrainian cultural treasures and values is, is enormous. Uh, of course, we had a lot of challenges, especially in the first day and the first weeks, even first months uh, of the large scale aggression. Uh, the war started in 2014. Um, and at that time, we also tried to understand how we have to respond. It was not easy, but the military operations, military actions were fr stopped in eastern Ukraine, in Donbass, Luhansk, and Donetsk region. Therefore, a lot of people relaxed, unfortunately. And we talked a lot, we tried to do something, of course, self-coordination, but it was not so relevant for majority of us than it became in last year, 24th of February. Um, and in that situation, when all, all Ukraine was attacked by Russian missiles, by air bombing, we need the high speed response. We don't have time to, to just to sit, to discuss, to analyze, to, uh, we should react. Um, the constant change of front line, and the front line is over 5,000 uh, 5, kilometers, it's a huge one. And it is very dynamic, and it was dynamic from the very beginning. It was hard to predict what to do, uh, what are our priorities, because it's not, it's not possible to evacuate the whole country simultaneously. Of course, we were lacking uh, the adequate solutions for evacuating of collections, a lot of things, and Katrina Chuno maybe will tell a lot uh, about this, because evacuation, according to Ukrainian laws, means evacuating the cultural treasures outside of so-called war zone, but all Ukraine was war zone. So evacuation, according to our law, means evacuating abroad. And it's a very complicated uh, process which needs a lot of coordination and agreements. Um, of course, the challenges were in co coordinating different policies and actions within the country and abroad. Most of my colleagues got a lot of questions the first day and the next day, so how we can help you? Simple questions, but hard to answer. That's why we needed coordination on different levels, horizontal, vertical, to, uh, to act effectively. Of course, we needed the crisis management leadership, and we did not have the such one because our system, cultural emergency system, is not developed because Ukraine quite a peaceful country since the Second World War. And we never considered we would, we would face such a disaster. And of course, lack of awareness by military of the cultural heritage importance. It was talked today on, 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 that, on, on the first session, uh, plenary session about the military should be our partners. And we talk in Ukraine a lot about creating a CPP unit, cultural property protection unit in Ukraine. And a lot of NATO, NATO armies and CPP units are going to share their experience. And we plan that our military will be our partners in protecting cultural heritage. And of course, one of the most important challenges, we are not ready for rapid response while having the military threat, while the conflict, the war was unfolding. So uh, to respond to the situation, uh, we immediately, within the first days, we founded a voluntarily initiative, which we named, entitled uh, HERI, Heritage Emergency Response Initiative, just with the mission quite clear, the mission to respond to the crisis. And we plan to coordinate to provide our own first aid and uh, salvage operations. Uh, we planned and we did documentation 
and um, of damage and crimes, misification, later memorialization of the war, and we now we are also engaged in uh, recovery and modernization of culture processes, which we discuss a lot today. And so uh, the partnerships not only in the words and ideas in the strategies, but in action. You can see that immediately the first months, the packaging materials were, were the most in need. And we launched our survey, Harry launched survey to answer the question, how to help. Uh, launched survey among our colleagues and we got a lot of requests and we sent them to our partners abroad. And you can see some of them mentioned here, including Alif, uh, Prince Klaus Fund, Sir, a lot of ministries. Um, so it's, it was very, very moving and very emotional how many, how the world reacted and how the world launched so-called uh, cultural land lease for Ukraine. And this is interesting, uh, this is a, uh, on, a, on a cardboard, among the packaging materials we have found this handwritten um, plate, good luck, we are with you, Louvre team. <laughs> very emotional for us, very supportive, because uh, we understood that the world, uh, all the world is with us. And of course, not only packaging materials, but also um, we helped our partners from abroad to provide financial support on the ground. And the Europa Nostra, we, uh, together with the Leaf Foundation, launched the, uh, the Solidarity Fellowship for Ukraine. Very important. We provided uh, some stipends and fellowship, not, not for all who need it, but the most active to cultural activists, those people from occupied territories, from other who were not um, caring about their own collection, people and, 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 and buildings, who were helping others. Um, of course, we, we also launched, I mean, Harry monitoring and documenting crimes, together with CRY, um, with Ministry of Culture for Ukraine and General Prosecution Office. It's very important because we wanted not to document crimes and to put files somewhere in our table. We wanted to be them instrumental. We wanted them to be taken one day to international courts. Um, and of course, we launched quite uh, intensive damage assessment, damage and risk assessment processes together with ICROM. Uh, we not only translated, we just adopted uh, the assessment tool uh, on uh, the cell mobile phone application. And e-commerce was also engaged, Ministry of Culture, and even National Council for Reconstruction, which was initiated by our government, by President of Ukraine. And we plan that all those documentation uh, will be uh, very, very instrumental, helpful for, for, for the recovery and for uh, prosecution in international courts. Very important it was for us, uh, 3D modeling in laser scanning. Uh, in Kiev, one day in, in spring, last a few months after, after the attack, uh, the Saint Sophia Cathedral, which is the UNESCO, in the UNESCO heritage list, happened to be under threat. There were a lot of information that Russians plan attacking downtown of Kiev and Sophia, Saint Sophia, this is fantastic um, um, complex, uh, was under threat. And we talked to many people, and they said it's not possible to protect any objects against the missiles. No sense of uh, sense of sex. No. Um, plywood, nothing, but documentation, very deliberate contemporary documentation, 3D scanning, uh, laser scanning can help us maybe to reconstruct if the cultural objects would be damaged. It, is, it was also quite important for us and we launched the capacity building, individual and institutional, and due to UNESCO, ICROM, Heritage for Peace, Chief Association in Italy, and we were so happy to get translated the UNESCO's and the Chrome's guidelines for evacuating cultural treasures, uh, values. And right now, we, we, we are in the process of translating Chrome's toolkit and handbook on first aid to cultural heritage. Also, uh, control of illegal trafficking is also one of our priority. And field, field trips, field expeditions, during which we do a lot of work because we would like them to be complex. Sometimes it's quite problematic because you have to get access to the damaged um, sites. Quite problematic, dangerous, uh, a lot of mines, uh, um, police engaged, armed forces. But we got some funds from Prince Klaus, from Alif, Ikrom, and uh, World Monument Fund. And uh, it's, it's for us very, very instrumental things. What can be done more? 
Of course, one year after, we also we again speak about better coordination. And we discussed a lot, we need a kind of a coordination body, a kind of a consortium, not for one project or that, but for providing all the necessary activities, for defining priorities, for providing analysis of the situation. And of course, we need stronger cultural policy and cultural sanctions. We talk a lot about this, and we see how international uh, bodies, international organizations are not effective in this situation. Uh, we need advocacy and promotion for Ukrainian culture, and we have in Ukraine quite effective Ukrainian institute, which provides a lot of cultural events abroad. So please, if you have interest, connect with them. Uh, digitalization of cultural property is a separate, very important uh, process which has been launched uh, in Ukraine due to international support. Documenting crimes, uh, we've been in the Netherlands due to the recent um, project, the last, uh, last week we've been to international criminal court and also discuss a lot how to combine because we have a lot of missions in Ukraine, but they work not in close coordination and sometimes duplicating the same efforts. Also, we need a strategy and action plan for cultural recovery, uh, reconstruction and modernization in Ukraine. It was our president clearly put that we plan not only to rebuild what was destructed by the Russians, but we would like to use this chance to modernize Ukrainian culture, to make, to make it accessible to the rest of the world. Um, of course, capacity building is important, and it's, it's a very, very fantastic in how everything is going on in Ukraine, a lot of institutions being supported by international partners. And um, you know, we always um, mention that all these fantastic, huge efforts all of all of the world should result in creating a sustainable national cultural emergency system so that our culture may become much more resilient because this war uh, may, may finish soon um, in, in peace, but this peace can be temporary because Russia is our neighbor. Nobody can predict and we have to learn to live in these realities and we should think about sustainable cultural heritage protection system. And of course, we need harmonization of Ukrainian laws with EU's and world uh, cultural legislation. So we have some plans and you can find them on our, uh, in our social media. We just define them in short term, mid term and long uh, term perspectives and coordination, documentation, risk mitigation. But what is important, this is the long term we are also discussed today because we want to activate the cultural emergency response model in Ukraine. We would like to make it sustainable. And of course, we want to integrate it into the world cultural emergency systems. So that's, that's in brief. Uh, thank you so much for the fantastic support, which we, uh, which we enjoy, if possible to say it's so, but we feel this partnership in actions. This is so, so important to us. Thank you so much for standing with Ukraine, and I hope that we will celebrate uh, the Ukraine's accessibility to the rest of the world. Thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you, uh, Ihor. It's, uh, you know, there's a saying, it takes a village, you know, to, to do anything. And in this case, it takes a world to help Ukraine. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Svetlana Strelnikova from the uh, National uh, Center for Research and Restoration. And I, I have a particular privilege because with Svetlana, we've only, we've emailed, we've Zoomed, but seeing here today, and we've worked together for the last uh, year, and it's just, uh, it's just good to see the brotherhood and sisterhood among people who are indeed helping to uh, safeguard a culture that's under such threat. Svetlana? Вітання всім учасникам форуму, особливо команді Алів, яка стоїть на варті збереження історико-культурної спадщини в світі. Yeah. Hello, hello. Just, just to say that I'm a part of Alif team and I will be also helping uh, Svetlana with translation. Uh, so uh, thanks to you all for being here and especially greetings and thanks to the uh, Alif uh, team uh, for preserving Ukrainian culture heritage. 
Я представляю Національний науково-досвідний реставраційний центр України. Це провідна державна інституція, яка створена 1938 року. Uh, yes, I would like to present you uh, the work of the National Research Restoration Center of Ukraine. It was founded uh, almost uh, 85 years ago. And, uh, Основне направлене нашу діяльність – це консервація, реставрація, дослідження, стажування, підтримка і допомога музейним закладам України, саме музеям, заповідникам і галереям. So the main objectives are to, uh, to restore, to, uh, to make the conservation works, uh, and so, uh, as well as to make the research, and uh, we mostly work with, uh, with the museums, with the resorts, and with the galleries. Реставраційний центр має три філії в Одесі, в Харкові, Львові, основна організація в Києві, яка якраз забезпечує збереження і допомогу музейним закладам по всій Україні. До війни, по крайній мірі, до 24 лютого 2022 року, у нас в Україні було 576 музеїв, які зберігали 1 мільйон, 1,6 мільйонів унікальних предметів Музейного фонду України. So, uh, till the full-scale invasion of, uh, so till the uh, 24th of the February uh, last year, there was uh, more than uh, 576 museums and uh, they kept more than uh, 11 millions of artifacts of different kinds. На жаль, наші музеї не були готові до такої повополитної руйнівної війни. І в цьому випадку я скажу, що тут теорія розійшлася з практикою. Uh, I would like to say that uh, unfortunately Ukraine uh, was not ready for uh, such a blood war that caused so much damage and I would like to stress the attention that uh, the, uh, the theory uh, was not uh, in hand with the uh, reality. На самому разі була порушена логіка, куди евакуювати, як евакувати, де транспорт взяти, де задати гроші. So the, our first questions were about logistics. So uh, what to evacuate firstly, where to evacuate, where to find the money so that to make it process happen. Переважні більшості музейні заклади, переважні більшості вирішували це питання самостійно. Ховали в квартири, до речі, в хати, в підвали в якісь фондові сховища, які не відповідали стану збережності музейних предметів. So at first, of course, the museum staff was mostly responsible to, to hide all the art objects and artifacts, and they even hide it in the, their apartments. And, but of course, they thought about the conditions, and at first the conditions were not uh, really uh, uh, the, the best so that to uh, make this happen. Самою великою проблемою стали це кадри, це люди. З початку війни в деяких музеях залишились по одному два співробітника, в основному жінки. І це була величезна проблема, з якою спітнулися музейні заклади. So, and uh, one of the uh, biggest problems was also uh, the staff and the people, because uh, after the full-scale invasion, uh, not a lot of people remained in the museums, and more, uh, moreover, it was mostly uh, women. So uh, for one museum, it remains like one or two uh, women in a, in a team. На сьогодні музейні заклади можна розділити на декілька категорій. Я трошки повторюся з паном Ігорем. Це перша категорія – це розграбовані, це ті музейні колекції, які вивезені за територію України. Тут називається всього декілька музеїв, тому що... Є проблеми розмістити. So, uh, uh, Slana would like to, uh, to uh, pay attention to some groups uh, of the museums uh, that were damaged uh, due to the war. And the first one uh, was the museums, uh, the collections of those were looted and uh, taken, uh, for, uh, taken abroad. And uh, you, uh, you have uh, had the, the slide with some of the museums, but it's only the few among uh, more. Частина музеїв була просто втрачена. Це попадання ракет, це пожежі, і таким чином ми втратили повністю деякі колекції. So uh, here you can see some of the museums that were completely damaged by the direct hit uh, and then by the fire and that uh, in, in these museums uh, all the collections and all the art objects uh, unfortunately are gone. Так ось мається велика проблема це з uh, вибуховими хвилями. Які відбулися, які відбулися у нас, перепрошую, десь я так туди перескочила, перепрошую. Так, я перепрошую. 
за буквами хвилями. Я, може, ви про це почитали, це в інтернеті було. 24 жовтня 2022 року в центрі міста було влучання двох ракет. Це була вулиця, на якій шість музейних закладів і реставраційний центр. До речі, це фото реставраційного центру. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, the first, the second group uh, is uh, the uh, museums uh, that uh, the buildings of which were damaged due to the blast waves. And uh, one of the biggest attacks was in October 2022 in Kiev, in the, in the very, very center of the Kiev, where six uh, national museums were hit. And uh, here you can see the picture of the uh, Kiev branch of the National Restoration Center. Стало питання збереження зруйнованого порятунок музейних предметів. Для реставраційного центру це перше було, що обстеження стану збереженості. Щоб розуміти, яка частина з цих предметів потребує реставрацію. Цю реставрацію можна робити на базі музею, чи найбільш складну потрібно транспортувати в Київ, Одесу, Харків і Львів. So uh, the process started and the first, uh, the first phase of the, uh, of the process for the center was to evalu uh, evaluate uh, what are the conditions of this art object and uh, whether we can uh, do the, uh, the work and restoration work directly in the museums or it needs more help so that we need to take it to the branches in Kiev, Odessa, Kharkiv uh, or Lviv and uh, to do uh, work with the special equipment there. Разом з тобою реставраційний центр спіткнувся теж з проблемою. Відсутність кадрів, переважна більшість реставраторів виїхала за кордон, відсутні реставраційні матеріали, транспорт, обладнання. So uh, the problems that we faced firstly was the staff shortage because a lot of the staff of the center uh, went abroad so that to save their lives and uh, also there was a very big lack of the restoration materials as well as of, uh, with the equipment and the vehicle so that to, uh, transport, to make the transportation. З перших днів війни команда реставраційного центру залишилась в Києві. Ми почали звертатися в різні організації за допомогою, тому що самі ми справитися не могли. І в цьому випадку зразу вже пішов нам з відкритими руками і душею це Алів, це Сміцовський інститут, це міжнародна транспортна компанія Uber. So uh, the core uh, team uh, of the center remained in Kyiv and for the first days they started the process of uh, reaching uh, the possible donors international organizations so that for support and uh, for, so and, and <laughs> Svetlana makes us so thankful to the Ali Foundation Smithsonian Institution and also uh, Uber company uh, that uh, were the first uh, to res to respond uh, to uh, to the needs of the center. Особлива допомога була Алів, саме фонду Алів. І починаючи з травня 2022 року, ми працювали в 250 музеях. So uh, one of the first help uh, was from, uh, uh, the most malleable help was from Alif Foundation and the work started, uh, the collaboration started from the May uh, 2022 and uh, from May till now uh, the uh, team of the center already worked in more than 250 museums in Ukraine. Почали ми свою роботу з деокупованих територій. Тобто ті території, які були під расистами, або ті території, де піддавалися ворожим ударам. Це Буча, Ірпін, Ворзель, Макаров, Бородінка, Бородянка, Чернігов, Актирка, Тростянець і дуже багато інших міст, де були дуже серйозні пошкодження. So here you can see uh, the cities from which uh, the center started their work. It was mostly the cities that were uh, temporarily occupied by uh, Russian troops and were had direct uh, hits. Наша робота полягала в тому, що кожного дня в 7 годин ранку ми виїжджали в музейні закради і поверталися дуже пізно. Таким чином ми проїхали 50 тисяч кілометрів. Пізніше трошки нам Смітсовський інститут допоміг нам з готелями, і ми виїжджали на тиждень на два. Тобто це була більш раціональна робота, тому що можна було працювати і реставрувати, і обстежувати. Разом з тим хочу сказати, що це було виїздів в тому році 1121, в цьому році вже 130. Це виїздів на, в музейні заклади України. 
Uh, so uh, also uh, from from the from from the first days, uh, we started to go to uh, to these museums, and the total uh, distance of uh, of the uh, journeys that we made is uh, more than fifty uh, thousand kilometers, and we already made more than one thousand uh, and one hundred uh, trips last year, and more than one hundred and thirty uh, this year. And at first, uh, also uh, Smithsonian, uh, it was very great help that helped with the uh, uh, to provide the hotels because it was really difficult for the team to go in the early morning at 7 a.m. and then return in the uh, in, in very late evening. And when Smithsonian was uh, so helpful to provide the accommodation, it really helped to uh, make more relevant support for two or three days. Я бігло вам покажу стан музейних стан музеїв і музейних предметів, які що відбувалося з нам з нашими пошкодженими творами. So here you can briefly yeah. see some pictures of the damaged art objects within the Ukrainian museum so that you understand uh, what should be done. В даному випадку це Тростянець, це Чернігівський музей, пробиті картини Черніговського художнього музею, уламки від ракет, уламки від металу в підрамниках, пробиті меблі Изюм. You can see the small. Uh, it was small metal from from the missile that was directly uh, hit the paintings, as well as uh, you can see these uh, uh, holes from from the direct hits to the paintings. Изюм камені баби. Так чекайте, щось вона не переключається. Дуже відома скульптура сковороди, яка реставрувалась якраз до того, як уже сталася пожежа. Yeah, it was the uh, Skovoroda Museum that uh, has, uh, by the way, the direct hit, and uh, and here's the uh, only one sculpture of Skovoroda. It's a famous Ukrainian philosopher, and uh, it was uh, fortunately it was saved, and that's how the uh, restoration works were made. Yeah. До речі, реставрацію проводили фахівці Харківської філії яка позазнала пошкоджень саме в Харкові. Там дуже серйозна зараз проблема із приміщенням нашої філії. And here you see representatives of the Kharkiv branch of the center and by the way uh, their uh, office in Kharkiv was also damaged. Це в Катюбинському музеї, тобто меблі, стіни. І на сьогодні що потрібно було? Це обстеження консервація, реставрація, саме збереження цих музейних предметів, які піш пошкоджені, якщо можна сказати, війною. Це обстеження в Іванково, картин Марії Примаченко. Uh, here you can see uh, the, the, the uh, works in Ivankiv, uh, it's in uh, Kyiv Oblast, and this is the works of the, uh, one of the most famous Ukrainian painters, uh, Maria Primaченко. Різні музеї. Ми працювали в самих різних умовах. І в підвальних приміщеннях, і в фондових, і в якихось інших саме сховищах, де зберігалися твори мистецтва. So we have been working in really diff different and difficult conditions. We are even have working in the basement so that to restore the painting just there now so that to have the immediate response. Дуже важко було працювати, тому що це була велика напруга. В музеях практично не було людей, з ким би хто б хто би з нами міг контактувати. Але незважаючи на те, ми виконували свої обов'язки, ми виконували свою місію. So it was really even difficult to to work psychologically and mentally because there were not a lot of people in in the cities and that museums were made and uh, but we still continue to do our mission. Я хочу вам показати приклади реставрації творів мистецтва на базі музеїв, які були пошкоджені під час військових дій. Here you can see also the examples of how the center representatives restore the paintings that were damaged. Ці предмети, дуже багато предметів, просто були нетранспортабельні, дуже великих розмірів, і неможливо це зробити було навіть привезти в місто Київ їх. The works were done directly uh, within these museums because they were immovable so that to put them to the uh, headquarters or to another branches of the center. Я хочу трошки зупинитися на допомогі реставраційному центру саме Аліфу, тому що без цієї допомоги неможливо зробити такий величезний пласт роботи, який був здійснений. And uh, now I would like to tell you a couple of words of the Alif support so that you understand how uh, how it was important for us. Це придбання реставраційних матеріалів, інструментів, реставраційного і наукового обладнання, 
допоміжних засобів і захисних, індивідуальних захисних теж засобів. So, uh, mostly it was about restoration materials and tools, then special restoration equipment, as well as uh, special chemical protection, including uh, gloves, suits, etc. Я перепрошую, погано переключається. Оце в даному випадку і пилісос, і підйомники, які нам просто необхідні були для роботи. You can, see, you, can see, yeah, you can see some of the equipment. Uh, uh, it was the vacuum cleaner on the left, and on the right it was the table uh, that helps you to, uh, to make the painting on that level so that you have to work with it. Різні інструменти, різні клеї, розчинники. Different types of clays or um, restoration materials. Захисні засоби для проведення консервації, реставрації і дослідження. In different types of chemical protection. Безпосередньо хочу сказати про гранти, які дійсно були у нас в Салів, оскільки в нас тема сьогодні 6 років саме цієї організації. Це величезна допомога, яка, яка просто нецінима. Крім того, що придбані були реставраційні матеріали, окремі реставраційні матеріали і інструментарій, була допомога щодо придбання наукового і реставраційного обладнання. Між Алів і Польщею був укладений договір з музеєм, з музеєм друкарства, і, друкарства, письменності і друкарства щодо навчання трьох наших художників-реставраторів саме на обладнання, яке працює для реставрації паперу. Це книги, графіка, Документи. So the next, uh, so the, the next, uh, the next grant project from Alif, uh, it was uh, providing the special equipment to the center, and uh, beforehand, so that to uh, train three representatives of the center, uh, they had uh, the special uh, workshops uh, in uh, in Poland, uh, in Grebochin uh, in the uh, in the Grebochin uh, Museum, uh, so that to uh, train how to use this equipment, and uh, then the this equipment will be uh, transported to Kyiv so, so that to, uh, the, uh, the uh, central representatives can work on it. Зараз на фото можна побачити якраз стажування наших реставраторів. Це доливочна машина і дезінфіціюючі устаткування. Зараз це обладнання на тому тижні має прибувати уже в Київ декількими штраншами. Uh, here you can see the photos from these trainings, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, museum representatives and the director of the museum, and here you can see also the uh, types of different equipment. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, it, uh, this or next week it will be already uh, delivered to, to Kyiv. Саме така величезний подарунок від Аліфу. Це, ви знаєте, що у нас немає свого транспорту. Це нонс для Національного науково-досвідного реставраційного центру України. Для нас була прибрана мобільна реставраційна лабораторія, яка дозволяє нам працювати як швидка допомога для виїзду, для транспортування інструментів, обладнання і проведення терміновішої роботи. And uh, the next one of the most important uh, projects supported by Leaf, it was to provide the mobile laboratory, to provide the vehicle uh, so that the, uh, the representatives of the center can go with the special equipment directly to these museums and make their works there. And uh, so uh, four vehicles to be provided and one is already operating in, in, in Kiev. Ми дуже вдячні, Аліф, оскільки сьогодні така дата і зустріч нас з колегами, тому що будемо говорити, якби не ця допомога, ми не змогли б зробити той величезний пласт роботи, який був зроблений за цей рік. Uh, we, have, yeah, we are very grateful uh, to Alif because uh, without Alif's support we cannot do uh, all this uh, work uh, in Ukraine. Thank you. Щиро дякую вам. Thank you. So I think uh, between uh, Svetlana and, um, and Ihor's presentation, I think the cultural workers that were shown in those slides in that presentation, these are people that are defending their country, their culture, and their freedom. And where Putin, in this case, has made culture both a justification for war, saying that Ukraine doesn't have a culture worthy of national sovereignty, the way to prove that, is to bomb it and to obliterate it. And I think what we've seen with Ihor's work, 
your colleagues and networks with Svetlana and your staff and Minister Chieva with, with, with the professionals that you've uh, sponsored and the networks you've created is people defending who they are. People defending who they are. And that is such a very basic thing to humanity. So now we have uh, 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 Salim al Menon, uh, an architect who's going to talk about the Iraq Heritage Stabilization Program. Salim, all yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll give a little overview of uh, Tak Isra. Uh, it's a project about an hour from the uh, center of Baghdad. Very complex project, uh, and we've been working on it uh, for a few years now. Uh, mainly because of the complexity of the project we and uh, the number of uh, stakeholders involved. What I'll try to do is give a general overview on how we're trying to respond to this crisis. So, uh, Takisra is a project uh, of a similar period of Hagia Sophia in uh, Istanbul. It was built by Kosru and uh, the Iwan, it's one of the largest unreinforced uh, brick structure in the world. And this is the project that uh, uh, Alif uh, is supporting, and uh, it's one of the uh, most interesting projects I've personally worked in. Now, when we, when we initially started working this project, it was interesting that uh, it, it was a crisis because uh, it started collapsing after uh, years of uh, neglect, uh, ISIS, ISIS was in this site. This was the main security gate. Uh, and these are photos of a collapse of uh, tons of uh, bricks, which uh, collapse, uh, not, not necessarily the original Sasanian, but uh, one of the intervention that uh, took place, poor intervention. And we're trying to kind of learn lesson from this and to avoid a uh, similar kind of mistake, which has uh, happened before. So the initial assessment uh, we, we visited before we uh, uh, responded uh, to put a, 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 a structure in place to make it safe. Our initial assessment kind of highlighted some key, key components. One, uh, uh, the arch was incomplete. It's a Nubian arch, which uh, is inclined on a 18 degrees. Uh, there was missing sections. Uh, uh, there was a number of uh, work that was undertaken, which, uh, uh, which was poorly done in the past. And of course, the, the climate uh, issue, uh, the soil and water, uh, uh, sorry, the water table, and the salinity of the uh, 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 water affecting and how it's eroding the structure. There were bricks delaminating uh, and uh, uh, inclined uh, uh, or, or twisted uh, uh, corners, which suggested that the ground is uh, giving. And that was our initial assessment. And from there, we decided to uh, take the next steps. And before the next steps, uh, uh, we, we looked at how we can begin to do some initial assessment, which resulted as on uh, uh, doing some photogrammetry geotechnical surveys, installing crack monitors, and uh, uh, to understand the water table. Basic uh, uh, investigation before we start uh, implementing further uh, uh, responses. So one of the past conservations, I mean, uh, this was done in the 70s. Uh, uh, it's at the top of the Yuan. Uh, it's quite interesting to look at uh, the concrete and the different layers of a uh, built of work. The the, the past intervention, how uh, poorly it was done, and uh, how materials were put together without really investigating the original structure and how to best respond to the environment and this kind of structure. So, uh, Alif emergency stabilization or initial response was to make this site safe. And in order to make it safe, we had to uh, uh, take down part of the modern structure, modern fabric, so that we could even erect this uh, 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 structure beneath it without uh, 
danger to uh, life or, or, or health of our uh, team. And this was very important. It, it, it almost became a sub-project within the overall project because in the last intervention, we, we were told that uh, two members of the team actually died on this site. So we had to do everything possible to make it safe. And after we've erected this structure, the lessons we learned from our initial assessment was to really carry out detailed investigation, to carry out and understand scientifically how, how the environment affects the uh, materials, how we can better prepare and support uh, uh, the Iraqi Cultural Ministry so they have a database of information that uh, whoever takes on this project, if not uh, in the immediate future, in the, past, in the future, in a long-term future, they have uh, 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 information that they can rely on and build up on that. So that our next stage, which we're about to begin, is uh, uh, to carry out detailed scientific investigation and uh, structural modeling. And for that, there's a very, uh, uh, some of the best uh, uh, expert on team, uh, in this team, spanning from America to London, uh, Iraq, uh, local team, uh, global experts, and we're going to begin to uh, understand initially what this, because uh, uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, modern intervention. What are the material characteristics of this? What is the original Sasanian uh, uh, material was? Why it's failing? How the environment is affecting this? And use this information uh, to develop a, a, a finite uh, element model uh, and uh, then start proposing what the conservation plan might be. Now, uh, the conservation plan, we don't know, and we want to kind of uh, allow the scientific investigation to kind of propose, uh, I mean, lead that. But we suspect, I mean, there's going to be initial micro-level conservation work where we begin to look at the mortar, the bricks, and then begin to see if we can, uh, 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 and if we need to rebuild part of it, uh, if it is warranted, which part, uh, the, the western end, the eastern end, and, uh, uh, but we'll, we'll allow our investigation to kind of uh, uh, guide us in this. Now, some of the lesson learned in this project was, uh, and it's, it's been a long and complex project, it's uh, uh, the importance of engaging the stakeholders. And uh, by that we mean stakeholders on the ground, the local community, the tribes, uh, the ministry in Baghdad, uh, the experts, uh, uh, be it from London or US or, 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 or Iraq, and how we kind of take the team together and work and develop not only the proposal but implementation on the ground. And of course, uh, the, the professional monitoring, and this we realized was one of the failing of a previous intervention, that on, on paper, everything looked uh, very good, uh, detailed, and uh, very well considered. But when it came to implementing, uh, nothing was implemented as it's supposed to be. So that's a very important lesson learned. And it's something that even on other projects we see, that uh, we take our eyes off the project for even sometime, you know, an hour, we go back and we see uh, things are not as, uh, you know, we'd want it to be. So, uh, that said, really, but uh, uh, there's a lot of components to this project, and I think the time for us is short. And uh, uh, thank you, Alif, and the rest of the team. Thank you, here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. If only it was what we write on paper. If only that came true. But I think, as was said this morning, the notion of flexibility adaptability to situations, and the ability to learn as we're doing a project uh, comes to the fore. Uh, next, we have uh, 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 Sane uh, Lecher, to, uh, who's the uh, Director of Cultural Emergency Response, uh, formerly part of the Prince Klaus Fund, but then declaring independence last year. Sane? Thank you, Richard, and thank you, everyone, for, um, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I realize that in this panel, I have a bit of a different position than the others who are sharing their direct experience for implementation on the ground, but I'm also speaking from a funder's perspective, uh, because we're 
as we have one foot in implementation for sure, we're also supporting, financially supporting projects. And I want to take you with me a little bit in how we think we can better respond to crises. So last week, um, as Igor already mentioned, I had the pleasure to uh, talk a lot with seven museum directors from Ukraine uh, to speak about their experiences of the last year. What can we learn? What can we do better to support you? Um, but also really telling stories about how much has actually happened, how much they've been able to do, how much they've been able to achieve, uh, and everything actually mostly from the very beginning on their own. And I thought this was a very powerful uh, quote from Elena, who was the di director of the National Museum of History of War in Ukraine, who said there's actually a lot one can do with civil society. And that's the starting point where I want to take you in this, in this presentation, um, because we as Cultural Emergency Response, we're uh, providing first aid to cultural heritage under threat in crisis situations, being it caused by natural hazards or conflict situations. And we work directly with local partners on the ground. And um, we firmly believe that uh, by strengthening um, local infrastructures that are already in place, we can actually provide a more efficient, uh, a more a quicker, um, and also more inclusive type of response. So that's why I want to talk to you about localization today. And um, localization is actually uh, building on that idea that there's a lot of uh, civil society structures already in place um, that can be strengthened and supported. And it's lent from humanitarian sector actually, which rethinks the way humanitarian aid is distributed from the ground up. So um, how uh, civil society actors can, can be in the lead uh, to determine approach and priorities, because usually they are generally better positioned to, uh, to do that. They are uh, most of the time the first ones to respond. Um, they also have access to networks and areas that we as international organizations do not have access to. And they're with the communities before, during and after the crisis, which means they can establish those type of relationships. So building on this idea, we are really rethinking how we can distribute our, uh, our supports, actually, how we can work with partners on the ground and how we can better uh, make sure that there's a quick response mechanism in a crisis situation that works directly with local partners in the lead. Um, this is our vision, so we really hope that in a one day, I heard, it, I heard it already in the panel before, that we don't have to exist anymore, but that there's actually an opportunity for uh, local communities that they can actually safeguard their heritage themselves, that they have the infrastructures to that, access to resources, knowledge, materials, etc. So we're trying to build on that through our programming, which at the core is, as I like to describe it, a cultural ambulance, which means that we really are in there f in the uh, heat of the moment, as you will, as a first aid actor. And we try to uh, include culture more and more in disaster response mechanisms. Of course, doing that type of work needs a certain type of preparedness as well. So we try to integrate that idea of localization in all our programming. Uh, so to be able to provide first aid and emergency response, we also realize that we need to ne invest in the infrastructures that need to be in place for that. So uh, we're all the, all the time developing our emergency response mechanism, meaning wh in what way can we provide funding as quickly as possible. Uh, it also means that we're actively monitoring and scouting to develop our networks in what we call gap countries. Where are countries that we don't have that much network in? Uh, how can we, what can we do to improve that? We also see that we need to help our partners strengthen their capabilities in this field as well. So we have a first aid uh, um, trainings where we also invest in the leadership of the people on the ground that we work that we work with. So what they can they do as organizations to apply for funding, for example? How do they manage projects, etc.? So we try to invest in all ways that we can in the local infrastructures and try to strengthen those. An important element of that is as well, is making a strong case of why this is so important. You are all here, so you know that it is, but you also know that sometimes a very hard uh, thing to sell, that why we are investing so much time in culture in the, in the heat of the moment in times of crisis. 
So gathering data to make that case, to show why it's so important, to show why it contributes to peace building, for example, is also something we actively engage in on an international but also on a regional level. And that approach of localization we try to consolidate in a new-ish program that we have, uh, which is our network of regional hubs. So we're setting up um, globally, kind of uh, mini, mini SARES, as you will, uh, which uh, are to form a go-to center in the region for the coordination and provision of cultural emergency response. So they can provide expertise, training, uh, they can stock up materials that can deploy quickly. Um, they do everything to, uh, to kind of create that response mechanism in the region. So we currently have, uh, we have four uh, hubs uh, and counting. Um, we have one in Lebanon, of which I have the, the pleasure <laughs> of having our hub coordinator here. Sure can uh, answer some questions later as well. Who serves the Levant uh, region. We have one in Central America, in Guatemala. Uh, we have one in the Western Balkans, Albania, Kosovo, uh, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we have one in development in the Caribbean region. And in a couple of years' time, we hope to have six to ten hubs all across the world. Um, the benefit of that is that they're also an international network, so together they can learn from each other's experiences, uh, they can support each other in times of, in times of crisis, and we provide also a um, kind of uh, a mentorship component to that, as you will, because the aim is that uh, we support them for two years, but it's not a project. We're trying to embed entities and local infrastructures that are there to last. Um, also after those two years. So together with our hub partners, we try to find follow-up funding as well to continue, uh, to continue uh, their efforts for cultural emergency response also after those two years. That's a challenge, but I'll come back to that later. So um, I want to share a couple of examples with you, actually, why we already see that this methodology is working for us, uh, but actually also other actors in, the f in this field to provide quicker uh, response, but also be more efficient. Uh, it's more tailored, actually, to the needs that are actually there on the, on the ground. And uh, it's also more inclusive because it allows, uh, allows the local actors to be in the lead of determining priorities and also knowing the, the sensitivities. So um, one example I want to start with is actually from our hub in Lebanon. They have developed this uh, Juizia training concept, which brings together um, the different actors that have played a significant role in the response after the Beirut blast to also consolidate that network and experience that they um, that they build up, and they bring together with the Department of Antiquities. So Sarkis is involved in this uh, in this as well, but also museum institutions, the Red Cross. Uh, the Lebanese armed forces they work closely with. An advantage of having, uh, continuing to build on that network that, that was created after uh, or in a crisis situation actually, um, is that you have the, cap the capability to, uh, of course, not lose that experience, but also to create uh, deployable capacity throughout the different sectors that you need to actually provide efficient cultural emergency response. Uh, because in the end, we of course hope that culture has a significant place in other dis disaster response mechanisms as well. So the juizia, which actually means readiness, uh, is, is a very important case for that and a model actually we hope to duplicate for our other hubs as well. Another example is that we actually, by um, investing in that uh, regional capacity, that we can create immediately deploy capacity in the region as well, in terms of people, but also into materials. So a good example of that is actually our hub in Guatemala, who has deployed twice in, in the past year. First time to uh, support the National Library of El Salvador in uh, safeguarding their collection ever after flooding. Um, at the time, there was not the materials necessary nor the capacity actually to deal with wet paper because that's quite a, a specific thing that you need to know how to, to do that. So our hub deployed with a team of experts to work with the staff of the library to provide expertise but also the materials. Second time, they uh, deployed to the uh, Maya archaeological heritage sites near the Mexican border. 
which are usually areas that are very difficult to access because of uh, well, the, the value the site has for, for local communities. But the advantage was because of the hub had already been actively working with these uh, communities and creating a network for some years already, he was actually granted uh, access to help uh, stabilize uh, the Mayan sites, which resulted that we have now uh, established a satellite hub near the Mexican uh, border to actually also provide that service to other um, uh, heritage sites in the region, so also in, in Mexico and in um, Belize. Um, a third example is actually that um, because we are committed to do a longer term investment in a partnership that we have, so two years and already before that, that's organizations that we know that we were working with, either they participated in our trainings, they did first aid projects with us, um, we have an opportunity to um, have a long-term trust relationship with, with them as well. And that has a very important advantage in how we, are, uh, we can distribute funds in an emergency situation. So it allows us to provide flexible funding, which is more or less a pool, that we, a pool of funds that we provide to be coordinated and implemented by the local partner, by our hub, um, who can then actually spend that according to priority and needs that arise on the field. So that wor has worked well twice already. Um, once was after the Beidou blast where um, the then not yet hub, but uh, Biladi, um, uh, NGO Biladi, who we have the, the hub with, um, was able to, to administer that funds and actually uh, purchase material that was needed for the different museum institutions they helped covering windows, doors, roofs, etc. And another example is more recent, which is with the Heritage Emergency Response Initiative in Ukraine, where they did the same thing. It was a flexible pool of funding, which they could actually use to organize their field missions. We were not in control of where those field missions were, were going to, what was prioritized. It was being Harry who was determining that approach, because who are we, in that sense, saying that this or that should have priority over the other. And that's, I think, is a model that we can explore further as well to see how we can uh, move even faster with the deployment of, uh, of funds. Uh, and last but not least, it's our hub in the Caribbean, uh, which we are currently setting up with the Cultural Heritage Emergency Network of the of Carbica. They're very fond of uh, abbreviations <laughs> uh, there, which is the Caribbean uh, branch of the International Co Council of Archives. And um, what is really interesting there is that because of its... Um, a long-term investment uh, of and in this topic already in the region uh, from a grassroots level is that they were actually able uh, last year when we uh, committed to to work with them were able to integrate culture in disaster protocols uh, of Curaçao and um, that's really important because in the whole disaster response in the region, being it one of the most vulnerable regions in this world right now because of climate change, they did not have a separate protocol for culture which prevented them from acting as a civil society group and the kind of lending them their experts to protect culture in a crisis situation. Because of the protocol, they're actually now open doors to also collaborating with, for example, the Royal Dutch Marines on the island, but also with Sedima. And Sedima is the regional organization that provides disaster response for the whole Caribbean region. And that, of course, makes it interesting because then we can see if we can give culture uh, more of a prominent place in the way they respond to, to natural disasters in the region. Um, so, in conclusion, we definitely see the benefit of working in a way that puts localization, uh, localization first. I think we can really uh, be quicker in, in, in our response because it, we have the, the people and, and the resources already in place, we have materials already in place, uh, therefore it's more efficient, we can have uh, local coordination points where Igor just said uh, there's really a need also to have one point sometimes that people to refer to. It's not replacing the others, but at least it's one go-to center where people can pick up information or discuss or organize or co coordinate, uh, coordinate things. And I also think what is an important element, I feel it's a more, import of a more inclusive approach of the distribution of funds as well, because 
um, it's not an international organization determining priorities, it's on the ground that priorities are being determined. Um, and also that gives access to uh, organizations, institutions, people that we would not have access to, uh, which makes the distribution of funding also more equal. As I said, this is also challenging. Uh, and I realized that um, we have been piloting different models of setting up hubs like this. And I cannot tell you for 100% that we've found the way of doing this. It's, it's extremely compli complicated to find um, a sustainable solution for this. So what happens after two years that we fund? Um, who takes over? How do we embed this in institutions that can either source local funding, uh, that th a that local government says, or regional, regional government says, okay, we take this on, we find it so important. So that's something we're still working on and thinking on. We're working with our hubs on that and finding regional funding solutions, for example, or us as an international organization, we can really have a bridge function there where we can connect the international field and our networks to, uh, to the regional networks networks, that seems to be working quite well, but that's a challenge. Um, and we heard it before already today, um, the connection of all stakeholders that, that, are, uh, that need to be involved. There's many people who, who want to help. How do you know um, that you don't duplicate things? How do you know that you don't um, uh, replace things that are already there? Because that's not the intention. So how do we get everyone on board and make sure that this is a system that does not only work for, for us as Sarah, but for the whole field? Because I think that's the conclusion that if we manage to do this together, that we really create an infrastructure that's also for recovery and reconciliation projects, because that's not what we do. <laughs> People can make use of the actors that are already in place and the capacity that's already, um, already in place. So I really think that this could be a good way forward for, for the field uh, in the future, and I fully agree with Milena if she says that there's actually a lot you can do with a strong civil society. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sana. And, uh, you know, I think Sana illustrates a marvelous point is that, you know, we all don't, everybody in this room who works in this uh, space and, and our colleagues around the world, we don't have the luxury of sitting around and spending three years thinking this out. We're, we're learning by doing, and we have to, and, and therefore I really appreciate the honesty that Sana, you, and Svetlana, and Ihor, and uh, Salim, everybody is bringing to this because we're learning by doing, and we don't have, we don't have that time. Uh, I, I, another hat of mine is being a professor, and I could sit around with graduate students and we could debate a lot about how to do things, but we do not have that luxury because of the people we serve. And so it's marvelous, I think, the honesty people bring to this in terms of trying to figure it out. Uh, now, uh, our uh, last speaker is uh, Ubelman, who's the CEO of Iconem. So that is him, but... Oh, I'm that is him, that is him, I am sorry. <laughs> But I'll introduce myself. I think I, I'm going to continue in French, not only out of pure patriotism, but also because I think what I say would be much more precise in French. Donc me voilà, je m'appelle Hulé Kéchichian. Je viens, je viens de Paris et d'Arménie et je représente aujourd'hui le centre Tumo, qui est un centre pour, qui œuvre pour l'éducation dans les technologies créatives. Alors, pour, euh, pour me présenter brièvement Tumo, euh, notre, on offre à des 12-18 ans une éducation, un accès gratuit à de l'éducation qui tourne autour de sujets tels que euh, la créativité pure, donc du design, euh, de la musique, mais aussi et surtout euh, de la technologie. La technologie, ça veut dire qu'on va donner des cours de, co de codage, des cours de modélisation 3D. Euh, notre approche de l'éducation est très libre. Euh, on a créé un logiciel euh, qui, euh, spécifique à Tumo qui s'exporte beaucoup maintenant. Il y a des centres Tumo qui ont ouvert à Paris, à Beyrouth, à Moscou, à Berlin. Euh, et on espère euh, franchiser au maximum notre euh, modèle qui, selon nous, est, euh, est une manière de donner accès aux jeunes à euh, des connaissances techniques euh, très utiles, puisque... Euh, notamment quand la guerre a commencé en Arménie, euh, nous avons voulu contribuer à notre manière pour préserver notre patrimoine, euh, en mettant l'accent sur euh, le scanning 3D, puisqu'on avait cette euh, composante euh, technologique qui euh, nous rapprochait 
de la matière. Euh, Là-dedans, grâce à Iconem, euh, nous avons collaboré avec Iconem, qui eux étaient déjà experts en la matière, euh, pour scanner une partie du patrimoine en danger euh, de l'Arménie. Euh, comment nous est venue l'idée L'idée, en fait, c'est parti de deux constats. Le premier constat qui nous a un peu horrifié, c'était de se rendre compte qu'il n'y avait aucune base de données étatique en Arménie euh, qui référençait les sites euh, protégés ou à protéger. Euh, et le second constat est celui de, de la menace extrême euh, qui pèse sur nous et de, de l'urgence. Euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, moi, je, je, c'est un exemple très personnel, j'ai déménagé en Arménie il y a deux mois de Paris. Euh, la première chose qu'on fait quand on arrive à Yerevan, c'est de regarder qui, où est le bunker de son quartier. Euh, on ne sait pas, on sait pas ce qui va se passer demain, on ne sait pas ce qui va se passer dans trois semaines. Euh, la menace est très lourde. Euh, et donc, euh, les actions préventives euh, pour préserver euh, des traces du patrimoine arménien sont d'autant plus, euh, plus importantes. Aujourd'hui, dans la région sud de l'Arménie, dans le Sunik, on a euh, déjà 140 km de terres qui sont occupées. Et euh, l'histoire nous a malheureusement dit euh, ce que la perte de terre euh, coûte euh, à l'histoire arménienne. Euh, nous avons déjà perdu des terres sur lesquelles ont été détruits euh, des monuments millénaires. Vous, vous avez peut-être pu entendre parler du cimetière de Julfa euh, dans le Narijévan qui abritait euh, des sépultures euh, du, du XIIe siècle, euh, qui ont été détruites, euh, sur, euh, filmées d'ailleurs de, depuis la frontière iranienne euh, à coups de marteau. Euh, on sait ce que ça va nous coûter euh, et donc on veut euh, évidemment préserver les monastères, les églises, les pétroglyphes euh, qu'il y a en Arménie, euh, les villages euh, dont, dont les fondations et les sépultures, encore une fois, datent de, de plus de 3000 ans. Euh, dans cette urgence-là, on a déjà collaboré avec Iconem, comme je vous l'ai dit, euh, de manière très rapide. Et ça, euh, la CEO de Tumo, qui est donc euh, ma boss, euh, dit particulièrement que c'est dû euh, au fait qu'on a eu cette liberté d'agir très vite parce qu'on est des organismes privés. On a essayé de notre part de passer par des organismes publics, mais évidemment, et c'est normal, euh, ce sont parfois des éléphants administratifs, alors qu'un euh, Tumo et un Iconem, en deux jours, euh, littéralement en deux jours, peut euh, se procurer de l'équipement, euh, avoir euh, une experte d'Iconem qui va prendre l'avion et qui va arriver en Arménie et euh, partir en expédition pour, euh, pour scanner des, des monuments. Euh, L'une des, des urgences qui n'est pas vraiment à notre main est évidemment l'urgence du financement, puisqu'il faut savoir euh, que c'est compliqué mal, malheureusement de trouver du financement de manière aussi rapide. Euh, et sur le plan opérationnel, nous, nous voulons nous engager à, euh, à faire en sorte de pouvoir réagir euh, dans les 24 heures. Donc ça, qu'est-ce que ça veut dire Ça veut dire qu'il faut avoir des experts qui sont disponibles. Euh, et quand je dis des experts, c'est d'avoir une équipe avec un expert euh, qui euh, est l'expert de la photogrammétrie, un expert du drone, euh, un expert euh, du, la, du scanning laser. Il faut aussi avoir des, des relations avec les locaux, parce que euh, de, quand on va euh, dans un site euh, qui est inaccessible, euh, finalement, bah, c'est le villageois ou le guide touristique euh, du coin qui va le mieux savoir comment accéder par des chemins euh, euh, tortueux euh, à, euh, à ces sites que nous souhaitons scanner et, et protéger, et documenter du moins, si on ne peut pas les protéger. Euh, la, loca la composante locale, comme ça a été déjà dit plusieurs fois, est ce qui nous préoccupe le plus. C'est pourquoi notre projet chez TUMO, c'est de créer un département en Arménie qui serait spécialisé dans le scanning 3D. Pour ça, on a évidemment besoin d'entraînement, de, de, parce qu'on est, on est loin d'être les meilleurs dans le domaine, et c'est là qui connaît nous aide le plus. Euh, et surtout, pourquoi on a besoin d'une équipe locale C'est que malheureusement, euh, le, conflit, le conflit en Arménie est, bénéficie de moins de solidarité, parce que moi, moins médiatisé et que moi, par exemple, pourquoi je suis rentrée en Arménie de France, c'est qu'on qu se sent responsable en tant qu'Arménien du patrimoine arménien. Parce qu'on n'est peut-être jamais mieux servi que par soi-même, en tout cas quand on a l'impression que peu d'autres vont pouvoir nous aider. Et donc c'est là aussi que je fais appel à vous, parce que je pense que c'est aussi le devoir des experts, si vous voulez, moi je ne peux pas en vouloir à... à à l'opinion publique de ne pas s'intéresser à un lointain pays, je ne peux pas. Mais c'est le devoir des experts qui savent d'agir dans l'urgence quand ils sont sollicités. Euh, et surtout, c'est un devoir qui est apolitique. 
euh, qu'on ne n'aide pas la population arménienne menacée. Ça, je le comprends aussi. C'est une, une zone qui est extrêmement complexe. Et euh, si vous voulez apporter une aide humanitaire, enfin, une aide militaire, pardon, en Arménie, c'est une chose qui est difficilement concevable pour beaucoup. En revanche, œuvrer de manière apolitique sur ce qui nous concerne tous, c'est-à-dire notre, notre patrimoine, l'humain, euh, le, le monument n'a rien de politique. Nous, nous, sommes tous, nous sommes tous les héritiers de ce patrimoine-là et c'est pour ça que j'espère qu'on agira tous dans l'urgence pour euh, préserver notre histoire. Je vais passer maintenant le micro à Yves. Merci. There is a remote. Oh, sunny. There may be a remote somewhere. Oh, here. <laughs> uh, bah, merci beaucoup pour, pour ce témoignage. Effectivement, euh, on a été euh, contacté par, euh, par Tumo pour agir euh, le plus vite possible. Et d'habitude, alors, donc moi je suis euh, Yves Bellman, je suis le, euh, architecte de formation et, et cofondateur de Diconem, cette compagnie qui développe justement euh, des technologies pour la documentation du, du patrimoine en danger. Et en fait, d'habitude, ce qui se passe, c'est qu'on arrive après la catastrophe, que ce soit à Beyrouth, après l'explosion du port, que ce soit à Mossoul, que ce soit à Palmyre. Donc, on a documenté ces sites, mais après la catastrophe. Et là, cette fois-ci, dans ce projet qu'on va vous présenter, la démarche a été différente. On a essayé d'agir euh, en Arménie avant une possible catastrophe. Alors, on ne peut pas prédire les catastrophes, mais par contre, on peut évaluer euh, le niveau de risque euh, qui pèse sur une région particulière. Et donc, on a travaillé avec TUMO pour essayer d'identifier, en Arménie, les zones qui étaient les moins stables. Ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'on a imaginé une buffer zone euh, à côté de la frontière, donc la frontière orientale de l'Arménie. C'est la frontière voilà, sur laquelle, effectivement, il y a des... elle est sous pression militaire, on va dire, et elle a Malheureusement, elle change. Euh, et dans ce, cette buffer zone, euh, on a euh, listé tous les sites importants. Et on a décidé, donc, les sites étant accessibles, les sites étant effectivement accessibles par les routes de, de, de l'Arménie, on a décidé de faire un inventaire, un archivage 3D de, de ces sites. Cet archivage, euh, donc, pour pouvoir le, le, le mettre à, à disposition des experts, mais aussi à disposition des étudiants de, de TUMO, on a construit une base de données qu'on voit ici. Donc on voit effectivement cette fameuse frontière, et tous les points bleus qu'on a autour de la frontière, bah, ce sont effectivement les sites euh, qu'on est allé un par un scanner, donc avec de la photographie, de la photogrammétrie et des drones, et, et cela dans différents régions, hein. là on est au sud par exemple, et donc on a pu en quelques semaines scanner plus d'une trentaine en fait, de, de sites sur ces régions euh, frontalières. Alors un premier exemple, alors je ne vais pas prononcer le, <rire> le nom des, des sites, mais euh, vous pouvez le, le lire parce que je n'ai pas l'accent arménien, mais premier exemple, une église, et ce que vous voyez ici en fait ce sont les tunnels militaires qui ont été creusés donc, par l'armée euh, d'Azerbaïdjan qui est de l'autre côté de la frontière. Donc vous imaginez qu'il y a à peine 50 mètres entre la frontière, donc les, les positions militaires et euh, l'église. Donc vous imaginez aussi la difficulté et la complexité de travailler sur ces territoires qui sont vidés de leurs habitants. Hein les habitants sont partis parce que c'est des territoires qui, sont, qui deviennent euh, trop, trop, trop dangereux. Et euh, donc l'objectif, et bien sûr, alors là on rentre un petit peu dans la, la plateforme, on rentre dans le, 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 le modèle 3D, et qui nous permet d'avoir des plans intérieurs, extérieurs, et de pouvoir effectivement bah, documenter avec précision ces, ces, ces sites. Voilà différentes, euh, euh, différents, différents monuments. Donc un autre monument, on a été euh, justement confronté à à beaucoup de monuments qui étaient très isolés, parce que ces zones près de la frontière, elles sont souvent difficiles d'accès. Étant difficiles d'accès, vous voyez que l'état de conservation de ces églises n'est pas forcément bon. 
on voit qu'il y a de la végétation effectivement qui a poussé euh, au-dessus des murs. Alors ce que vous voyez ici, en fait, c'est un, un nuage de points. Donc ce sont des millions, voire des milliards de points qui reconstituent par le procédé de la photogrammétrie donc, euh, la forme et la couleur du, du, du lieu en question. Hein. Et euh, là, vous avez le même monument euh, effectivement, dans lequel du coup, on peut rentrer, voir euh, l'intérieur et voir euh, euh, pierre par pierre en fait, ce, qui, ce qui reste. Donc documenter, c'est bon, archivé pour le futur, mais c'est aussi sécurisé d'une certaine manière. Une, une fois qu'on documente effectivement euh, une zone et qu'on sait que les pierres sont sur cette zone, ben, ça rend plus difficile leur destruction ou plus difficile leur disparition parce que euh, euh, on, on, on peut témoigner que euh, voilà, ces, ces, ces pierres euh, euh, étaient là euh, donc, euh, à cette époque. Donc, ce qui est intéressant aussi dans le cas de, de monuments qui sont disons, un peu perdus dans la forêt, en travaillant sur ces, euh, sur ces modèles 3D, bon, là encore, on peut dessiner, révéler en fait, les plans euh, de, ces, de ces églises, donc l'épaisseur des murs, donc le, le, leur stabilité aussi, et pouvoir effectivement faire euh, des, des évaluations en fait, de, de, de stabilité. Euh, la documentation photogrammétrique per, permet aussi d'avoir une vision millimétrique, voire, voire inframillimétrique, en fait, des, des sculptures, des bas-reliefs, hein, et euh, on a différents moyens pour les, justement les visualiser et pour voir en détail effectivement ces, 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 ces décors. Alors, des exemples d'églises de, comme ça, effectivement, on en a beaucoup. Euh, C'est le principe de l'inventaire. Euh, et ce qui est important, alors qu'on commence à avoir beaucoup de données, ce qui est important, c'est de pouvoir les stocker et de pouvoir les partager, surtout les partager aux experts internationaux et aux Arméniens et, et au monde entier, en fait, hein. Et c'est donc le rôle de toute cette infrastructure de plateforme qu'on a construit justement pour répondre à ce besoin de, 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 de prévention. Alors, les modèles 3D, on peut les couper un peu dans tous les sens. Donc, on va étudier, on va pouvoir prendre des mesures, on va pouvoir étudier facilement, justement, à distance, en fait, cette, cette architecture. Là, on voit effectivement... Donc ça, c'est une vue des mêmes données, donc le nuage de points avec, euh, avec des couleurs. Et là, c'est le nuage de points en transparence et on voit toute la structure interne, hein, y compris euh, euh, les poutres, euh, les pierres. Et, euh, et ce qui permet d'avoir voilà, une vision aussi euh, architecturale très précise hein, de, 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 de ce monument. Alors, on, va essayer de... on peut aussi, donc, en élévation, faire des, des coupes. Euh, euh, évaluer le poids de la maçonnerie, donc là encore la, stabili euh, la stabilité générale du, du, du monument. Donc on a travaillé à la fois avec des architectes spécialistes des structures, à la fois avec des historiens aussi pour contextualiser en fait, ces relevés. On a fait des recherches euh, dans les archives textuelles pour voir aussi euh, où étaient mentionnés dans quel, do, dans, dans quel document étaient, étaient mentionnés en fait, ces, ces édifices pour pouvoir les dater avec plus de, plus de, plus de précision. Et bien sûr, tout un travail justement sur euh, l'avantage, c'est qu'on peut du coup prendre des mesures de manière très précise, hein, des hauteurs, des largeurs, euh, qui nous permettent là encore de définir... Euh, euh, de définir. Voilà, ça c'est un autre exemple euh, encore plus complexe et évolué d'architecture arménienne qui est aujourd'hui quasiment, euh, quasiment rendu, euh, rendu inaccessible. Hein. On voit euh, bah, des états de destruction du coup, qui sont effectivement préoccupants. On peut essayer d'évaluer, alors indépendamment du contexte géopolitique cette fois-ci, aussi euh, l'urgence d'intervenir de, de, sur ces maçonneries tout simplement pour que ces maçonneries restent debout parce que même s'il si ne se passe euh, aucun euh, problème euh, euh, d'un point de vue militaire en fait, c est, c est, c est, ces églises sont en, sont en danger hein. euh, donc il donc, euh, y a voilà, certaines églises qui sont quasiment invisibles en fait, hein, qui sont tellement prises dans la végétation qu'elles sont quasiment invisibles aujourd'hui donc il faut effectivement grâce à à ces techniques de drone, grâce à ces relevés intérieurs, bah on peut effectivement en avoir euh, euh, tous, les, tous, les, tous les détails. Alors, ça, ça c'est le, le, la vue euh, en plan, en fait, 
donc euh, avec la végétation. Et, et là, c'est la vue justement bah, voilà, sans, sans la végétation. Donc ça permet effectivement de voir aussi des édifices qui sont aujourd'hui complètement invisibles. En fait. Donc il y a tout un travail euh, effectivement de... de d'approche, de recherche, parce que ces édifices ne sont pas forcément visibles sur les vues satellites. Il faut effectivement justement s'appuyer sur la connaissance locale, les communautés, pour aller rejoindre ces édifices. Et souvent, ça prend deux heures, quatre heures pour trouver la bonne route ou pour, pour, pour trouver effectivement le bon point, le, le bon point GPS et, et, et pouvoir effectivement du coup positionner. Voilà, ça c'est l'intérieur de, de cet édifice. Donc là, on a encore une structure encore plus fragilisée euh, qu'il va falloir effectivement restaurer euh, euh, sans trop attendre hein, et sans attendre la, la, la catastrophe non plus. Hein. Voilà, c est, c est, ce sont des différentes vues. On voit aussi dans ces édifices qui, qui n'ont pour, pour certains plus, plus de... Je me dépêche. I will speed up. Euh, on voit la qualité aussi du, du décor et de la sculpture hein, euh, donc qui rend encore plus bah, indispensable en fait, ces, 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 ces interventions. Voilà. Donc, juste une idée un petit peu générale de, 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 de toutes ces églises qu'on a documentées. D'autres ont été... Euh, restaurées parce qu'elles sont plus accessibles, elles sont dans les villages, mais contiennent des trésors, hein, des trésors de peinture. Voilà. Euh, là, là encore, qu'on a pu euh, numériser avec très grande précision avec ces procédés de photogrammétrie, et notamment sur des peintures qui étaient euh, difficiles d'accès, en partie haute. Hein. Donc, ça va aussi euh, constituer un corpus hein, pour les historiens, pour les chercheurs, justement, qui pourront étudier avec plus de précision ces euh, œuvres, œuvres d'art. Voilà. Donc, on, a, on avait des églises, on a aussi des villages abandonnés, comme effectivement euh, ce, 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 ce village qui a été euh, abandonné pendant le, 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 le bloc soviétique. Là encore, parce que euh, voilà, c'était des localités qui étaient trop éloignées. Donc, finalement, ce qui est ressorti aussi de ces missions, qu'une bah, qu menace importante, euh, outre effectivement les conflits et la guerre, c'est tout simplement l'éloignement. Hein. L'éloignement de, de cet héritage qui, qui effectivement, euh, bah, rend très difficile euh, son, son, son entretien. Donc voilà un petit peu ce tour d'horizon. Cette base de données, actuellement, euh, elle, est, elle est disponible à tous les experts qui cherchent à travailler sur, sur, sur l'Arménie. Euh, à, aux, aux Arméniens. Notre objectif, c'est de l'ouvrir le plus possible. Et si certains d'entre vous, justement, ont besoin d'accéder à ces données, ben on, on est ravis d'en donner l'accès. Et je vais peut-être te donner le dernier mot. Oui, non Pourquoi pas <rire> Enfin, pour résumer un petit peu, le, le, effectivement, c'est que ces données vont aussi servir et, et servent aujourd'hui à TUMO aussi à la formation à la fois technologique, mais aussi à l'éducation, euh, l'éducation sur l'histoire de l'Arménie. Merci. Euh, bah, je vais à peu près répéter la dernière phrase. Euh, je pense qu'il y a deux... Il y a, on, on en retire deux choses. On en retire d'une part, évidemment, euh, des merveilles pédagogiques, puisqu'on apprend beaucoup. Euh, ces expériences-là aussi permettent de pousser la technique... Euh, euh, par l'expérience, on comprend ce dont on a besoin, ce qu'on peut faire dans des situations d'urgence, ce qu'on ne peut pas faire dans des situations d'urgence. On se forme de plus en plus pour pouvoir répondre au plus vite euh, en cas de besoin. Et évidemment, euh, c'est aussi un devoir de documentation historique euh, qui nous importe particulièrement euh, aux Arméniens de garder une trace euh, de ce que nous avons été, de garder une trace à un instant T aussi, parce que ça nous aide, par exemple, euh, en, scannant, euh, en scannant un édifice euh, euh, aujourd'hui, euh, je pourrais savoir dans 20 ans à quel point il s'est détérioré. On peut aussi comme ça euh, déterminer des manières de protéger, plus ou moins savoir ce dont on a besoin pour protéger notre patrimoine. Euh, donc voilà, euh, c'est pourquoi on est très, très reconnaissant et qu'on aime de nous former euh, à la préservation de notre patrimoine. Merci. Thank you. So we're, uh, it's amazing technology, and I think we'll have continuing uses over time. So we're, we're running quite a bit late.
but I thought, again, if we had any particular, wait, I'm hearing myself being translated. <laughs> that is not good. <laughs> I'm talking in English and I'm hearing in French. So the, um, uh, I think we have time maybe for just a few questions. If somebody has a question that they want to direct to one of the panelists, uh, Parna, you're first, or a comment in general, but please keep it directed and quick. Parna. I thank you uh, for your excellent moderation as well as for the great presentations that we have heard in this panel. Um, I divided my time between this and the other one. Um, I would like to ask to all panelists and also to you, Richard, uh, you have been now working in the field of emergencies for a long time. And I've been listening and I'm myself thinking about this morning on my phone, I had a, um, a message from Vanuatu, which has had suffered two cyclones, one, one earthquake. There are certain parts of the world we simply do not reach out to. And there are some parts of the world we reach out to. And we also have Syria and Turkey in front of us, where 11 cities in Turkey have been damaged. 11 cities, and they're thinking of mounting response in 11 cities. My question is, what is the difference between the timeline of mounting response in the case of a conflict and in the case of a, I'm not going to call it a natural disaster because no disasters are natural. I'm going to call it a disaster situation where, you know, what is the timeline difference in your experiences? And till when can we say that we are going to give response for this much of time and then early recovery will start. So phase delineation, I'm talking about phase delineation because it seems that in certain situations the response continues and new actors keep on emerging. And in another types of situation, you need to have some sort of a, you know, like you're moving towards a certain point. So I hope my question is clear. I would like to know from all of you what do you think, in your experience, is the timeline for putting people on the ground in case of a conflict, in case of a disaster? No natural disaster. OK, and I don't think we have time to go for, through all the panelists, because I'm getting told by Sandra that we have to wrap it up. So uh, I don't know, does anybody have a particular? Sana, you want to take that? Sure. Thank you for the question, Aparna. Um, it's a difficult question because, like, if, if you would have to say it, if you would, would want to respond immediately, of course, but the difference is also that you have to take into account, of course, ongoing humanitarian efforts. And as I said earlier, it's still difficult sometimes to integrate culture in that immediate response. So depending on the situation, it also depends on what is the right time to uh, to go in, as you will. Um, there, again, it helps to really base yourself on, of course, the network of local experts that, that is there and can give a first report on, on, the, on the ground. So we're also doing that now with Turkey and, uh, and Syria. So what is the good moment to intervene? Um, and I think the line between immediate response and early recovery is very blurry, especially in, in the work that, that we all do, because it often goes hand in hand, right? Uh, so there's evacuations, for example, but at the same time you want to do some consolidation. Um, but what I do notice is that often cultural emergency response get, gets pushed into the early recovery phase as humanitarians do not see, uh, see a place yet uh, for culture in the first phases. And of course, saving human lives is still more uh, important. So, Igor, you, yeah, no? Okay, I, do you want to take it or are you? <laughs> So, and I, I, I think, look, remember why Olive gets going in the first place. Olive gets going because there's a need to respond quickly, relatively quickly. One, is there permission and is there a relationship with people inside a country or in a place that say, yes, help us. We have situations where, I, I remember personally after the uh, tsunami in Japan, where we reached out to the Japanese to say we could help. And the Japanese government said, no, thank you, <laughs> because people felt that they, they wanted to do it themselves. So you need permission. 
that was in a disaster situation. The other thing is having the money, and that's what Olaf was for. So many times, and we see it on TV with humanitarian relief, you're raising the money to respond. You're going to somebody to talk them into doing it. The whole point is to have that funding available to act quickly. So I think some of the things you've heard, flexibility, quick, um, uh, effective, local involvement, partnership, using that network of collaboration, all those come into play, and then you hope that you can do it, and you say, inshallah. And with that, we'll include, we'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you.